You're watching live coverage from the Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. We're standing by for House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who's poised to name the team of House impeachment managers who will prosecute the case against President Donald Trump before the Senate. This is the first event in a historic day on Capitol Hill in which we expect the House to vote on a resolution that will trigger that transmission of articles of impeachment over to the other branch, the Senate. We'll bring you that vote live and uninterrupted. Now, after weeks of political jockeying, today is a day of political pageantry on Capitol Hill. The House managers named in the press conference plan to walk the articles across the Capitol and present them over into the Senate chamber. I'd like to welcome my guest, Jackie Alemany, who is political reporter and anchor of the Power Up newsletter, uh, which you can read every morning. Jackie, you've been covering the election so much because that's been such a, a big story in politics. But now our eyes are turning our attention back to impeachment. How historic is this moment? It has been pretty confusing toggling back and forth between what presumably was supposed to be the biggest story in the country right now and now I mean it's back 2020 to this right we're finally trial. at 2020 this election year exactly and I'm not sure anyone could have anticipated that we would have been going into this election year with Donald Trump uh, on trial to be impeached by the Senate um, but it's a huge moment he is the third president who is going to uh, you know be on trial for um, pretty serious charges which is uh, asking the Ukrainian, pressuring the Ukrainian government to open an investigation into his political rivals um, in exchange for access to the White House and from withholding military funding. So I think it's important that we don't forget the core of these charges. There's been so much partisan back and forth, a lot of gamesmanship, uh, a lot of strategery from both sides, Republicans, Democrats, as they each try to set the parameters of the impeachment trial their way and you know we have we've seen we've seen Nancy Pelosi withhold these articles a pretty unprecedented move mm -hmm. by keeping them in the house rather than transmitting them the night that the house actually voted to impeach the president mm -hmm. uh, and and her only doing that today in order to create some leverage here so there's been this weird pause we sort of thought we'd be going into the new year uh, right off the bat into this impeachment trial. Um, but now it's looking like it's going to be starting on Tuesday. And you still have Senate Republicans and Democrats going back and forth at what this trial is going to look like exactly. Yeah, that negotiation process isn't even over yet. No, mm -hmm. and you know we don't have House managers picked. Those are the people who would actually be sort of litigating this trial and presenting the case before senators. Uh, there are a few things that we do know. You know, Chief Justice Roberts is going to be presiding over the uh, the trial, um, you know, we know that it requires two thirds of, of of senators to vote to make a rules change. Um, but we don't know if there's going to be witnesses called. We don't know if there's going to be new documents, and there's still a, a lot up in the air. Well, let's go live to Capitol Hill, where my colleague Rhonda Colvin is. Uh, Rhonda, I know you're heading over to the Pelosi press conference in just a few moments, but I'd like to go through the timeline of today. First up, Speaker Pelosi will address reporters. What do you expect to hear? That's right, Libby. In just a, a few short minutes, Speaker Pelosi will name those impeachment managers that she has chosen to prosecute the case to uh, the Senate when the Senate trial begins. And just to give you a little bit of background, back when the Clinton impeachment happened, there were 13 impeachment managers that were sent from the House to the Senate trial. We are unsure at this point if there will be that many this time around, and we are certainly unsure who those people will be. There has been a lot of speculation, but if there is anything we do know is that Speaker Pelosi has kept all of this very close to the vest. She has not been willing to give hints in terms of who she is going to choose for this job, this very important job, in taking uh, the House argument to the Senate. Great. So what are your insights into this decision process, Rhonda? Well, my insights, if, if we're able to take any hints from Speaker Pelosi in the weeks leading up to this, she's been very quiet about the next steps. She, as we just uh, talked about, she withheld the transfer of these articles for the last few weeks, almost a month, and that was unprecedented. And if you're trying to figure out where she's going to go from this, it's really hard to say. I think we're all going to be learning uh, as the day goes on what is next in terms of how the House is going to handle this part uh, of the impeachment process. I think that uh, she's received a 
lot of criticism from the Republicans, of course, that's no surprise, in the fact that she did hold these articles back. And in fact, uh, yesterday, uh, the minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, accused her of possibly pay playing politics with the presidential election, that she withheld them to give Biden an edge because all of the, most of the candidates have to come back off the trail in the days leading up to Iowa to attend the Senate trial. So there has been a lot of criticism in her choices, but uh, it remains to be seen what we will know by the end of today. Mm. Thoughts on impeachment managers. You know, this has been really a mystery even to, to people who are close to Speaker Pelosi. There are a couple of folks who we have assumed uh, would have that role, that responsibility. Um, we're probably going to find out in just a few short minutes, but do you have a sense of how the Speaker has been making this choice? Well, if we look back at how at the beginning of this uh, session of Congress, the 116th Congress, she did keep in mind diversity. That's one point that uh, did not happen back in the Clinton impeachment. If you look at the 13 uh, House managers for that impeachment, they were all white men. This time around, she has the most diverse Congress. So there is thought that she might perhaps want to showcase, the, showcase this in uh, her choice of impeachment managers. She has more women. She has more people of color. And, and that thought was a part of the strategy when they chose committee chairs of the House last January and when they chose House leadership. So that might be interesting to see when we find out who these people are, how many of them are women, how many of them are people of color. All right, so what's next, Rhonda? The House convenes later today and does what? Later today, they are going to bring up the resolution to transfer the articles of impeachment to the Senate. So we know, yes, they've already voted on the impeachment back on December 20th. But what happens today is a resolution. It's a legislative measure to transfer those articles to the Senate, and the Senate gets to work on them. We're also going to see a very uh, ritualized procedure where these House managers that are announced in a, a few moments, they will physically walk over the impeachment articles to the Senate side of the Capitol. It's a, a little bit of a walk. You're going to probably see a lot of cameras at one point when they hit the Capitol Rotunda. That's when they will pass over these articles uh, physically to the Secretary of the Senate, and then the, uh, we will uh, go forward with the Senate trial from that point on. We saw the same walkover during the Clinton uh, era when he was going through this impeachment process. When, when you see this historic footage and we're looking at it right now, what, what goes through your mind, Rhonda? You know, I think about how we can all agree that our politics are a little dysfunctional right now, a lot of polarization. But when you see moments like this, the formality that uh, is a part of this approach in the impeachment, it reminds you how serious this is. We don't typically see a lot of these uh, antiquated procedures uh, a lot uh, anymore. And I think we're going to see that now that the Senate trial is uh, about to get underway. So it just reminds you of the gravity of the situation, how uh, very, very important these proceedings are, even though many might argue that we already know what the conclusion is once it gets to the Senate. We really don't know. And, and we're all going to be learning as we go. And if anything, we're all going to be getting a, another great opportunity for a civics lesson uh, as we learn more about how the Senate approaches proceedings like this. Sullivan reporter on Capitol Hill. Rhonda, you are somehow managing to be all places today at once, so we'll let you go so you can sprint over to Speaker Pelosi's press event. Thank you so much, and we'll check in with you later on. All right, so uh, Rhonda Colvin dashing over to the speaker's press conference. You know, this has like become sort of a high drama moment because we are expecting her to announce these impeachment uh, House managers, and we've all been waiting to see who it was. You know, oftentimes these things sort of leak out. This has been something that while we can speculate on who she might choose, and, and Rhonda uh, pointed out the diversity is something very important to the speaker, um, this is something that she's she's been weighing and considering, thinking about and um, is important to, to, to her as well as the Democrats' case because these are the people who will be presenting the evidence before the Senate. Um, so they have to have mastery of the case. That's why, for example, Adam Schiff is expected to be, to be part of this, someone who was involved in this process throughout as head of the Intelligence Committee. They also have to be willing to sort of take the heat. Um, they've got to be able to have not just command of the facts, but, but command of the chamber of the Senate, Jackie. Right, and that is, I think, what is the most important thing to Democrats. Uh, you know, I recall uh, there was a lot of anger and frustration with uh, Chairman Jerry Nadler after he 
moderated and headed up the uh, trial where Corey Lewandowski testified after the Mueller report about his interactions with President Trump. And that was the Judiciary Committee hearing, and, exactly. and Lewandowski was really able to, to totally control that hearing. Dominated mm -hmm. the hearing, mm -hmm. um, and Democrats felt like it was a waste of time and also, you know, hurt their case, and which is why you saw Chairman Adam Schiff of the House Intelligence Committee come forward and take a leading role, and Democrats were really happy with his performance, specifically House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Sources close to her say that he's all but, you know, the decided one on this. Um, and as you have also said, equally as important, has, uh, you know, has mastered this information, especially as it's still incoming. You know, House Speaker mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi is about to an announce that they're transmitting these articles against the backdrop of new information coming in just last night. We had Lev Parnas, one of the shady characters whom Rudy Giuliani enlisted to help, you know, uh, facilitate this foreign interference, this uh, solicit the help um, of the Ukrainian government to commence an investigation into Hunter Biden, uh, just released documents last night showing um, additional, you know, moves and um, actions taken in Ukraine to pressure Zelensky to open the investigation. Uh, a whole new character, actually, that we haven't even heard of throughout the entire, you know, series of over a dozen hearings, um, this guy Robert Hyde was is suddenly now implicated in the pressure campaign. It was shown that he had threatened uh, Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch, the former ambassador to Ukraine, who was then sent back after Rudy Giuliani uh, complained about her and you know her reticence to an investigation and complained to Donald Trump, and, and he sent her back to the U.S. and. Hyde uh, actually indicated in text messages to Giuliani that he was surveilling her and was trying to take her out in some capacity. You know, we saw these embarrassing notes, writ handwritten notes from Giuliani, um, misspelling Zelensky, uh, but also saying in very explicit terms that he was going to get Zelensky to open an investigation. And it's important to, to, to note that Robert Hyde is a Republican congressional candidate in Connecticut and someone who really promotes President Trump and talks a lot about like his relationship with President Trump. Um, so th this is you know, new information that just came out uh, last night. We will be talking to our reporters who br broke this story and who've been reporting on this later on throughout the day, because we're going to be here throughout the day uh, covering all of these momentous uh, procedural steps in this impeachment uh, drama. So Paul Son, Rosalind Helderman, and Tom Hamburger you know, reported uh, about this new information released by the House Democrats. Right. It really raises the question of if senators are going to call Lev Parnas, as well as other people, to come before them to give this information. Yeah, and so that is something that's going to be pretty contentious, I think, until until the witness until witnesses are really sorted out. And it's also possible that even if you know McConnell is able to keep his uh, majority in line and prevent any new witnesses from being called, that there's still going to be an outpouring or a trickling, perhaps, mm -hmm. of of new information, and that's why, you know, I think a lot of Democrats are confident that Adam Schiff is perhaps best positioned to handle all of these different moving parts. Um, but right now, what we know, uh, Sung Min, Kim, and Rob, Bob Costa confirmed a political story last night that um, McConnell's having talks with the the best legal minds in his majority. You know, that's Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Lindsey Graham, um, about this witness situation and. I think why it's so important here is because we had this Washington Post uh, poll, ABC poll, ABC News poll done a few weeks ago that showed that while Republicans are overwhelmingly against impeaching Donald Trump, they do want to see a, a fair and impartial trial. And a lot of moderate Republicans who are on the line, who are running for re-election this September, uh, you know, they also need to sort of play a fair arbiter here and look like they're engaged in a fair process. Their voters don't want to see this partisan food fight. So what Ted Cruz uh, and Mike Lee suggested to the president is that, and to Mitch McConnell, is perhaps, you know, they offer up one witness in exchange for one of their witnesses. Mm -hmm. So that would be John Bolton potentially in exchange for Hunter Biden to come testify. And then if Demo Democrats clamor for additional witnesses, what Republicans will do is they'll show them the rest of their list and you know, Democrats are probably not gonna wanna hear from those people. Joe Biden's not gonna wanna get up there and have to testify in the middle of uh, a pretty intense Democratic primary. You know, Jackie, Democrats, uh, 
that I've talked to have sort of been enraged by <laughs> this idea of like a witness for a witness. Right. And they've said that the witnesses we want to call are people who are directly relevant to this case. You know, Joe Biden is like a bystander in their estimation. Right. And so they think it's like trying to drag the Bidens into this drama in a way that will negatively impact Joe Biden as he tries to run for president. Right. That, and that's, I think, gets to the whole heart of really this impeachment story that Republicans and Democrats are telling two completely different narratives here and are living in completely different realities. You know, Democrats believe that they're really acting in good faith, uh, that this is, at the end of the day, was completely a f conspiracy theory that was actually turned down by the Ukrainian um, prosecutor. Uh, and that Joe Biden, you know, is not culpable for this in any way. Um, Further complicating things, you know, there was a report that came out earlier this week that the Russians actually hacked Burisma, the company that Hunter Biden was on the board of, that Giuliani and, and President Trump were so interested in getting information to, um, you know, potentially picking up on that this would be a, a great way to sort of do 2016 all over again and fracture the electorate, potentially selectively leaking proprietary emails or information that would just be damaging to the Democratic Party going into 2020. And the tough thing too is if, if that information is leaked, it'll be hard to even verify if it's if it's true or not true and it could throw sort of everything into disarray. I wanna point out that it's 10 o'clock and you see a shot there of uh, the, the podium where Speaker Pelosi will be coming out before reporters. Any moment now, we'll bring that to you live and uninterrupted. Let's look at what we expect to see today. So uh, 10 o'clock here, Speaker Pelosi going before reporters. We expect her to name the impeachment managers. Later on this afternoon, the House will formalize that. They'll, they'll take that vote and then they'll kick these articles of impeachment over to the Senate. And we do expect to see that ceremonial transmission this afternoon, this evening, really five o'clock, uh, the transmission of impeachment articles as we watch the managers walk those articles through the Capitol from the House over to the Senate. And I, you know, Rhonda said it so eloquently, it, it, it really does get you back to the basics of the history, the tradition, and the procedures that are at the heart of so much of what Congress does, Jackie. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to Senator Joe Lieberman yesterday, uh, who was part of the Clinton mm. impeachment investigation um, in 1999. And, and he actually was a pretty unpopular Democratic senator at that time because he was one of the few who was sided with Republicans, potentially, you know, I guess if you're looking at it, compared to to, the, to this day and age, a potential Mitt Romney or Susan Collins, someone who was, you know, preoccupied with making this a fair and impartial process. And he uh, ended up waxing on about the brilliance of the framers in creating and in, in being able to have the foresight to create this system and this process to hold the president accountable and how it was done so brilliantly that the process still stands and is still relevant uh, to in this day and age. So many questions, though, about just how the process will unfold. And, and we're seeing, you know, Mitch McConnell has talked about, the top Republican in the Senate has talked about how he wants things to follow the, the sort of the same path and procedures that the Clinton impeachment process took. But it does right. seem like he's cherry picking a little bit, you yeah. know, because there were a lot more agreements sort of ahead of things on both sides of the aisle heading into the Clinton process in terms of like how things would go. Would there be witnesses called? And so McConnell seems to kind of want it both ways a little bit. Right. And this goes again back to Democrats belief that Republicans are, are being intellectually dishonest about the process. Uh, you know, during the Clinton impeachment investigation, uh, there was over a thousand subpoenas issued and every single one of them was answered. I talked with Phil Schlero, um, who helped with impeachment uh, for Clinton back then. Um, and he's also actually advising House Speaker Nancy Pelosi now on the process. Uh, and he actually gave me that figure and said um, that it's a remarkable contrast to what's going on now and that you didn't have you know, the biggest and most important and central characters being blocked from testifying by President Clinton. Everyone cooperated. They had access to all documents. All document requests were met. That is not what is going on right now. You have the president who's, doc who's blocked Mick Mulvaney, his chief of staff, from testifying. Mike Pompeo, who actually ordered directives um, to the Ukrainian embassy in Kyiv about how to handle uh, Giuliani's sort of shadow campaign to, to pressure um, uh, President Zelensky. So there are completely different circumstances here. You're exactly right. Jackie, you know, this question of witnesses and whether we'll get new information from someone like John Bolton or Lev Parnas, is there a chance that the House could continue their efforts, that, that they could keep investigating 
And then what does the House have to weigh? They have to weigh both the, the hunger for information with how it looks. Right. I, you know, I'm not sure we're going to see the House continue their investigation separately. I think it would sort of muddy the waters for what the Senate's going to be doing. And uh, at the end of the day, that is what Democrats want to be in the public eye. And that's what they're banking on to sort of move the needle of public opinion because you know, impeachment is a political process, and if you, if if the public is not overwhelmingly in favor of impeaching the president, it's there is no pressure on any Republicans to shift their position um, and and vote against him. Um, that being said, there are a lot of questions about what exactly John Bolton, what new information he could bring forward. Uh, you know, my sources who have worked closely with him and are still in the administration have said that. If you look at the testimony as a roadmap for what we know already, it's clear that John Bolton tried to stay away from this process as much as possible, constantly, you know, directing people, his aides like Fiona Hill and Tim Morrison, to take things directly to uh, the the NSC lawyer whenever they had concerns, rather than engage and indulge these characters like Giuliani and Ambassador Gordon Sondland, who also got caught up in this mess. Uh, so Bolton might be a big, buzzy name, and I think people are going to pay a lot of attention to it. But at the end of the day, this is someone who doesn't want to be a pariah of the Republican Party, wants to maintain his reputation. He's got a book coming out uh, and, wa- and, and might go to great lengths to provide cover for the president, although he could potentially reveal embarrassing information. But it might not be enough to actually change people's opinions. Mm. So we're waiting for Speaker Pelosi to come in here and uh, and address reporters. We do expect her to name the impeachment manager, so we'll see who comes in to the room with her that, that may say something to us as we as we watch that unfold. We'll bring that to you live and uninterrupted, and then we're going to come back throughout the day uh, as these news moments happen. We'll show you live that vote that's going to happen on the House floor today. We'll also show you that transmission of impeachment articles as they make their way from the House to the Senate. You can find us at WashingtonPost.com. You can also find us on YouTube. Just look for Washington Post there. And if you subscribe on a place like YouTube to our to our Washington Post channel, you'll be able to follow all of this stuff as it happens. Um, Jackie Alemany is my guest, anchor of the Power Up and political reporter. Um, Jackie, as everyone looks at the body of the Senate and, and, and the Republicans, there's a question about where there might be some, well, in the eyes of Mitch McConnell, vulnerabilities or, or weaknesses and sort of the, the wall that Republicans were so well able to hold over in the House. Um, Democrats might see it as opportunities and the general public might just see it as, as, as people who are willing to search their soul and really ask themselves, you know, am I coming to this with a true impartial judgment. So we're talking about people like Mitt Romney, potentially Lisa Murkowski. Right. Um, what are they weighing? Who else are you watching uh, who, who might say, you know, I, I really do want to hear from witnesses. I have I have unanswered questions at this point. Yes, yeah, so there are a handful of people that we're watching and that the White House is watching as well. And is, is the White House is very well preparing for defectors, potentially. Um, and that's, as you said, Utah Senator Mitt Romney, uh, Alaska Senator uh, Lisa Murkowski, Maine Susan Collins, Colorado's Cory Gardner, um, and even people potentially like Rand Paul now uh, and Lamar Alexander, um, people who, you know, are are, fa- are, are are originalists when it comes to the Constitution um, and also believe in a fair process. Who don't necessarily think that the president did anything impeachable, but want to see the process done well and think it's a reflection of, of a Republican majority. We're uh, expecting the speaker to come out in, in just a few moments. You know, I, I do want to set the stage for what's to come. So this has been a long waiting process. You know, We expected Speaker Pelosi to um, move this forward and here she is. Let's see the Speaker Pelosi uh, presser as it begins. We'll go to it live now. Mm-hmm. Good morning, everyone. This is a very important day for us. And as you know, I reference temporal markers that our founders and our poets and others have used over time uh, to place us in time, to emphasize the importance of time, because everything is about time, how we use it, how we, make, how we uh, mark it. And today is an important day, because today is the day Uh, that we name the managers, we go to the floor uh, to pass the resolution to transmit 
uh, the articles of impeachment to the Senate, and later in the day, when we have our engrossment, uh, that we march uh, those articles of impeachment to the United States Senate. As I've said, it's always been uh, our founders, when they started, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, when. Abraham Lincoln, four score and seven years ago. Thomas Paine, now are the these are the times that try men's souls, the times have found us. Again and again, even, even our poets, uh, Longfellow, remember, listen my children and you will hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive that remembers that famous day and year. It's always about marking history using time. On December 18th, the House of Representatives impeached the President of the United States, an impeachment that will last forever. On, since December 18th, there have been comments about when are we going to send the articles over. Well, we had hoped <clears throat> that the courtesy would be extended, that we would have seen what the process would be in the Senate. Short of that, uh, that time has revealed many things since then. Time has been our friend in all of this because it has yielded incriminating evidence, more truth uh, into the public domain. Since we passed the articles uh, on December 20th, two days later, new email showed that 91 minutes after Trump's phone call with uh, President Zelensky, a top office of management and budget uh, aid asked the Department of Defense to hold off on the Ukraine aid. On December 29th, revelations emerged about the OMB director and acting chief of staff Mulvaney's role in the delay of the effort by lawyers of the, in the administration to justify the delay and the alarm, this is very important, that the alarm that the delay time uh, caused within the administration. On January 2nd, newly unredacted Pentagon emails, which the House subpoenaed and the President blocked, raised serious concerns by the Trump administration officials. By Trump administration officials, they were concerned about the legality of the President's hold on the aid to the Ukraine. On January 6th, former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton said he would comply with a subpoena uh, to testify and that he has new relevant information. On January 13th, reports emerged the Russian government hacked the recurring gas company, Burisma, as part of their ongoing effort to influence U.S. elections to support in support of President Trump. And just yesterday, the House committee, two of our chairmen here, uh, Chairman, Chairman Nadler of Judiciary, Chairman Schiff of Intelligence, uh, Chairman Elliot Engel of Foreign Affairs, and Chairwoman Maloney of the Government Reform, uh, uh, they uh, released new evidence pursuant to a House subpoena. Uh, Lev Parnas, you know who that is, an associate of Ruli Giuliani, that further proves the president was the central player in the scheme to pressure Ukraine for his own benefit in the 2020 election. This is about the Constitution of the United States, and it's important for the, the president to know and Putin to know, the American voter, voters in America should decide who our president is, not Vladimir Putin, Putin in Russia. So today I'm very proud to present the managers who will bring the case, which we have great confidence in, in terms of impeaching the president and his removal. But this further evidence insist that and we wouldn't be in this situation had we not waited, insist that there be, that there be witnesses and that we see documentation. And now you see some of that change happening on the Senate side. I hope it does for the good of our country and to honor our Constitution. So today, on the floor, we'll pass a resolution naming the managers, as I mentioned, appropriating the funds for the trial and transmitting the articles of impeachment of the President of the United States for trying to influence a foreign government for his own personal and political benefit.
Chair Adam Schiff of California, our lead manager, Chairman Schiff, uh, uh, is, as you know, chair of the Permanent Select Committee <coughs> on Intelligence, is serving his 10th term in Congress. <coughs> Excuse me. Before Congress, Mr. Schiff was a California state senator and served as a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles for six years, most notably prosecuting the first federal FBI agent ever to be indicted for espionage. <laughs> Chairman Jerry Nadler, chair of the House Judiciary Committee, is serving his 15th term in Congress. Mr. Nadler served as the top Democrat on the Judiciary Subcommittee on Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties for 13 years. Before Congress, Mr. Nadler served in the New York State Assembly for 16 years. Wow. Chair Zoe Lofgren, Chair Zoe Lofgren, Chair of the House Committee on House Administration, which has jurisdiction over federal elections, is a senior member of the House Judiciary Committee. Ms. Lofgren is serving her 13th term in Congress. This is Chairwoman Lofgren's third impeachment. As a Judiciary Co Committee staffer in the Nixon impeachment, as a member of the Judiciary Committee on the Clinton impeachment, and now as a manager in this impeachment of President Trump. Chair Hakeem Jeffries of New York, Chairman Hakeem Jeffries is the chair of the House Democratic Caucus and is currently serving his fourth, fourth term in Congress. He's a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, before being in Congress, he served in the Assembly of New York for six years, an accomplished litigator in private practice before running for elective office. Mr. Jeffrey, Jeffries Church for, clerked for the Honorable Howard Baer, Jr. of New York District Court for the Southern District of New York. Congresswoman Val Deming, Demings of Florida. Congresswoman Val Demings is a member of both the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and the House Judiciary Committee. Ms. Demings serving her second term in Congress. Before Congress, Ms. Demings served as the Orlando Police Department for 27 years, part of that time as the first woman police chief in Orlando. Congressman Excuse me, Congressman Jason Crow of Colorado was a member of the House Armed Services Committee. Mr. Crow served his country, our country, bravely as an Army Ranger in Iraq and Afghanistan. Before coming, running for Congress, uh, Mr. Crow was a respected litigator in private practice in Colorado. Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia of Texas. Congresswoman Sylvia Garcia is a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Before Congress, Ms. Con Ms. Garcia was served in Texas State Senate previously. Uh, she was the director and presiding judge of the Houston Municipal System and was elected city controller. Ms. Garcia was later elected the first Hispanic and first woman to be elected in her own right to the Harris County Commissioner's Court. As you can see uh, from these uh, descriptions, uh, the emphasis is on litigators. The emphasis is on comfort level in the courtroom. The emphasis is making the strongest possible case to protect and defend our Constitution, to seek the truth for the American people. I'm very proud and honored that these seven members, distinguished members, have accepted this serious responsibility again, to protect and defend for the people defending our democracy. When we leave here, a little bit later at noon, we'll go to the floor and pass a resolution uh, naming the managers officially. But I wanted to say more about them here uh, and, and to say that the decision to come down in favor of litigators is necessitated uh, by the uh, clear evidence that we should have witnesses and we should have documentation and we have to make the strongest prosecution, not only of our very strong case, but of all the information that has come forth since. We're going to take a few questions. Speaker Pelosi. Yes, sir. If time has only strengthened your case, why did you rush to have a vote before Christmas? And Mr. Chairman, why hold only public hearings for just two weeks? Well, couldn't you stretch this out longer in order to get this more information that you consider that's only bolstered your case? Well, I'll yield to the distinguished chairman, but I will say that we had a strong case for impeachment of the president and removal for the president. Anything more would be in terms of 
where we go in the Senate, and I yield to the chairman. So we, we've always felt a certain uh, urgency about this uh, impeachment, given that the president was trying to get foreign help in cheating in the next election. But as soon as we did take up and pass the articles, Mitch McConnell made it clear that he didn't want a trial in the Senate, that he didn't want to hear from witnesses, that he didn't want documents. And this time has given us the ability to uh, show the American people the necessity of a fair trial, to expose the degree to which McConnell is working hand in hand with the subject of the impeachment, the president, to essentially turn what should be a trial into a sham. Uh, and that, that time has been, I think, very effective. Uh, in not only bringing new evidence to light, and the evidence was already overwhelming, but also forcing senators to go on record. Do they want a fair trial, one that's fair to the president, but also fair to the American people, uh, or are they going to participate in a cover-up? Uh, so I think it's been very effective, and, and as you've seen, additional evidence continues to come to light that not only has bolstered an already overwhelming case, but has also put additional pressure, I think, on the Senate to conduct a fair trial. Uh, and the last thing I'll, I'll say is uh, Ms. McConnell has taken to saying that the Senate should only consider the closed record that comes from the House. Uh, and as if what the Senate is is not a trial but an appeal from a trial. But of course, the Senate, the framers had in mind a real trial with witnesses and evidence. And if McConnell makes this the first trial in history without witnesses, it will be exposed for what it is, and that is an effort to cover up for the president. Uh, finally, uh, some have suggested as, as uh, part of your question, why didn't we wait uh, to get more testimony? Well, we have sought McGahn's testimony, Don McGahn, the president's lawyer, um, since April of last year. We still don't have a final court judgment, so yes, we could have waited years to get testimony, further testimony, from all the people the president has been obstructing. But essentially, that would completely negate the impeachment power. That is, allow the president, by virtue of obstruction, to prevent his own impeachment. And uh, that was an unacceptable course, particularly when the whole object of the president's scheme was to cheat in the election, which is the ordinary mechanism for dealing with a corrupt presidency. I was very discouraged to see uh, Mitch McConnell sign on to a resolution dismissing the case. That, to me, dismissal is cover-up. Dismissal is cover-up. Do you want to speak to that, Jerry? Yes. Let, me, let, me, let me add to that. There is an overwhelming case, beyond any reasonable doubt, uh, that the president betrayed the country by using by withholding federal funds appropriated by Congress, breaking the law in doing so, in order to extort a foreign government into intervening in our election to embarrass or to try to embarrass a potential political opponent of his. There's overwhelming evidence of that. We couldn't wait because, I mean, some people said, well, you know, t let the election take care of it. He's trying to cheat in that election. So it is essential that we bring this impeachment to stop the president from trying to rig, not from trying, he tried, from rigging the next election, from conspiring with a foreign government as the Russian government attempted to, to, to rig our last election. The, over, the evidence is overwhelming. The, the latest evidence uh, with, the, with Parnas and Giuliani makes it even more so. It made sense to wait a while as the more evidence piled up but we have to proceed because the election, the integrity of the election is at stake. Let me add one other thing. This is a test of the Constitution. The president's conduct violates the Constitution in every single way, trying to rig an election, stonewalling the Congress and saying no one may testify because I can have a cover-up despite Congress. But it's a test of the Constitution now. The Senate is in intended by the Constitution to conduct a fair trial. The American people know that in a trial, you permit witnesses. You present the evidence. If the Senate doesn't permit the introduction of all relevant witnesses and of all documents that the House wants to introduce, because the House is the prosecutor here, then the Senate is, is engaging in an unconstitutional and disgusting cover-up. 
So the question is, does the Senate, the Senate is on trial as well as the president. Does the Senate conduct a trial according to the Constitution to vindicate the republic? Or does the Senate participate in the president's crimes by covering them up? Thank you. Well, I've always often quoted, uh, and Mr. Jeffries quotes, uh, Abraham Lincoln, public sentiment is everything. Over 70 percent of the American people want to see a fair trial, whatever that, whatever the outcome, a fair trial with, with, with witnesses and documentation. And uh, we haven't seen even the rules. We put our rules out in October uh, for the next couple of months, uh, that the next few months that followed uh, for our uh, making the case. Uh, we haven't seen what the rules are in the Senate. But we do know uh, that in the time that has transpired since December 18th, the American people have come down in favor of a fair trial, which they always wanted, but meaning uh, uh, that it would entail having uh, witnesses as well as documents. Anyone else want to speak to that? My colleagues? Mr. Jeffrey. Well, the evidence is overwhelming uh, that Donald Trump corruptly abused his power by pressuring a foreign government to target an American citizen for political and personal gain by withholding $391 million in military aid to Ukraine without justification. There is a mountain of evidence in that regard. In America, no one is above the law. That is why the House proceeded with great leadership from Speaker Pelosi, Chairman Schiff, and Chairman Nadler to hold this president accountable. The Constitution required it. Our democracy required it. Given the evidence that has been built to date, the American people deserve a fair trial. Our democracy deserves a fair trial. The Constitution deserves a fair trial. So we're going to simply follow the facts, apply the law, be guided by the Constitution, and present the truth to the American people. Speaker Pelosi has given us the space for the American people to weigh in over the last few weeks, which has led at least four senators, which is the magic number, to publicly indicate that in their view, a fair trial does include the presentation of documents and the presentation of witnesses. We certainly hope that is what will take place. Mr. Speaker, can I just add, if I could just add really quickly onto this, um, and I thank uh, Chairman Jeffries. I just want to underscore the importance of documents, because we spent a lot of time uh, talking about John Bolton and other witnesses. Um, witnesses may tell the truth, and witnesses may not tell the truth. Documents don't generally lie. Uh, and in the documents that we submitted to the Judiciary Committee just last night, you see the importance of documents because included among the Parnas uh, documents we obtained is a letter uh, from Giuliani uh, trying to set up a meeting with the President of Ukraine, Zelensky, to discuss a particular matter. Um, of course, we know that matter is the investigations that the President wanted Ukraine to undertake of his political opponent. Um, there have been, there's been speculation from time to time, maybe the President or his allies will throw Mr. Giuliani under the bus. That letter makes clear that Giuliani, in his own words, is acting at the behest and with the knowledge and consent of the president. There is no fobbing this off on others. The president was the architect of this scheme. Um, these documents are important. We have only obtained a very small sample of the universe of documents that the president is withholding. Uh, if Mr. McConnell wants to follow the Clinton model, as he keeps professing, all of the documents were provided before the trial. Those documents should be demanded by the senators. If the senators want to see the evidence, they should demand to see the documents uh, and not participate uh, in an effort to 
a stone wall or cover up the president's misconduct. And uh, witnesses were deposed. Yes. Uh, you know, as the speaker mentions, the other, of course, profound distinction between now and the Clinton case is that the witnesses that the House managers sought in the Clinton trial had already testified. Their testimony was known. So the question for the senators then was, do we want to hear them again? Uh, and there was another question not present here, which is, do we really want to hear witnesses talking about sex on the Senate floor? Uh, that's not the issue before us. Uh, the issue here is, does the Senate want to hear from witnesses who have never testified? People who, like other witnesses, have firsthand information. Uh, and unless the president is willing to concede everything the House has alleged, these witnesses are very pertinent and relevant. And so uh, this is another profound distinction between the Clinton uh, investigation and trial and where we are today. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker uh, having witnesses for the prosecution opens up potentially having witnesses for the defense. And Republicans have suggested they would like to call Hunter Biden. Are you, the managers, prepared for that? Would you like to speak to that? Let me it's say, we are, we are prepared, but the relevant question is relevance. Is relevance. In any trial, you call witnesses who have information about the allegations, about the charges. The allegations, for which there's a mountain of evidence, are that the president betrayed his country by trying to extort Ukraine by withholding $391 million in military aid that Congress had voted in order to get Ukraine to announce an investigation of a domestic political opponent. That's the allegation. Any witness who has information about whether that is true or not true is a relevant witness. Anybody like Hunter Biden who has no information about any of that is not a relevant witness. Any trial judge in this country would rule such a witness as irrelevant and inadmissible. If someone is accused of robbing a bank, witnesses who say we saw him run into the bank, or we saw him someplace else, are relevant. A witness who says he uh, committed forgery on, a, on some other document is not relevant to the bank robbery charge. That's the distinction. But let me just say that um the, what is at stake here is the Constitution of the United States. Uh, this is what an impeachment is about. The president violated his oath of office, undermined our national security, jeopardized the integrity of our elections, tried to use the appropriations process as his private ATM machine to grant or withhold funds granted by Congress in order to advance his personal and political advantage. That is what the senators should be looking into. This is a president who said the Second Amendment, excuse me, Article 2, says that I can do whatever I want. It does not. He's undermining a system, the beautiful, exquisite, brilliant genius of the Constitution, the separation of powers by granting to himself the powers of a monarch, which is exactly what Benjamin Franklin said we didn't have a republic if we can keep it. So this is a very serious matter, and we take it to heart in a really solemn way, in a very solemn way. It's about the Constitution. It's about the republic if we can keep it. And they shouldn't be frivolous with the Constitution of the United States, even though the President of the United States has. The President is not above the law. He will be held accountable. He has been held accountable. He has been impeached. He's been impeached forever. They can never erase that. I'm very proud uh, of the managers that we have. I be believe that they ha bring uh, to this case in the United States Senate, great patriotism, great respect for the Constitution of the United States, great comfort level in a courtroom, great commitment, again, to the Constitution. Jerry being the chair of that Constitutional Subcommittee for 13 years, Zoe uh, being involved in three impeachments, and there are others bringing uh, their uh, re uh, intellectual resources and their knowledge <coughs> to all of this. 
So I thank them for accepting this responsibility. Uh, I, I wish them well. It's going to be a very big commitment of time, but I don't think we could be better served than by the patriotism and, and uh, dedication of the managers that I am naming here this morning. Thank you all very much. Speaker Pelosi names her impeachment managers, the men and women who will be responsible for presenting this uh, trial to the Senate. I'm Libby Casey. You're watching live coverage from The Washington Post. Uh, we'll be continuing to cover the proceedings live today. We'll be back later on this afternoon as these get voted on in the House. There's the formal process of the House impeachment managers being voted on and, and also the funding to enable the process to go forward over in the Senate. And then this evening at 5 o'clock, the articles of impeachment will be walked over by these impeachment House managers to the Senate. Speaker Pelosi saying that she chose the managers based on their ability to litigate and b because of their comfort in the courtroom and their ability to seek the truth. I'm joined in our studio by Jackie Alemany, political reporter and anchor of The Fix newsletter. Um, Jackie, you know, some were expected. Um, we've got Chairman Nadler, we've got uh, Chairman Schiff. Um, we saw Zoe Lofgren picked, not a big surprise because she's someone who not only sits on the Judiciary Committee, but she is a, a close ally of Speaker Pelosi, and she was on the Judiciary Committee back during the Clinton era. She was even a staffer during the Nixon impeachment process. Um, let's talk about who else uh, was named to this committee. Yes, yeah, so Hakeem Jeffries was also named, and that's also no surprise. He's been a staunch defender of Pelosi. He was one of the few House Democrats uh, who really stood by her um, until really the end of the line when people were all pressuring her to actually commence an impeachment investigation. And Jeffries was one of the people who was so, sort of trying to slow roll his members on it. Um, but the other two choices are, are really interesting and I think sort of um, Aside from the fact that they are highly qualified uh, and, and rising stars uh, in Congress, um, but they sort of check off more interesting boxes that Rhonda alluded to, which is that uh, Sylvia Garcia, who represents Texas, was actually the first Latina elected to D.C. to, to represent Texas. Yeah, um, one and of then, the first two. Pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you have Val Demings, mm -hmm. who's a former police chief. Um, so both of them are, you know, are bad, you know what? Um, they are. Uh, they've made a name for themselves for asking tough questions in hearings. They've shown themselves to be highly competent uh, during those hearings, which you know a lot of the times I think members, especially junior ones like Val Deming, sort of fumble as they're trying to have their moment and they don't actually get. Um, you know, relevant information across from the witnesses that they're cross-examining. Uh, so I'm, I, I, this, they're exciting choices, I think, um, and do are reflective of the really diverse caucus that Pelosi has and, you know, that uh, 2018 really brought in, brought into her house. Um, Jackie, I have to apologize. I think I said you were with The Fix. You're, of course, with Power okay. Up, the morning newsletter. You know, also of relevance here, Jason Crow, a congressman who is interesting because he's not on any of the, the main committees that have been going through this process. He's not not on judiciary. He's not on the Intel Committee. He's on Armed Services, but he was a, a litigator. He was a lawyer in private practice in Colorado before he ran for Congress. And as Speaker Pelosi pointed out, uh, he was an Army Ranger who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, and as Pelosi said, she chose made these choices based on who's comfortable in the courtroom, who has experience as a litigator, um, and who can really make a strong case here. I think what's also really interesting is that in this group of people, you don't see any of um, the congressmen and women who have been really outspoken about impeaching Trump from the very beginning mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. there wasn't substantive information per se. You know, the Rashida Tlaibs and, and Al Greens of the world who called for his impeachment right off the bat, right when they entered Congress. Uh, these are people who have been very deliberate, mm -hmm. um, moderate in the process, and again, who have been loyal to Pelosi throughout mm -hmm. this process um, and really stuck to party line here. You know, it's so interesting. Val Demings was someone we were watching because she sits on both the Intel Committee and Judiciary Committee, and uh, and she has this history in law enforcement, and you just see her like not getting rattled, like someone who's like not totally. phased by the pressure of these committees and the spotlight and the questions, um, and and she's 
uh, been able to sort of you know go through this process from from soup to nuts because she does sit on both those committees. Yeah, I was just um, reading this New York Times article about her, and one of the quotes. Uh, that she gave the reporter was, I've enforced the laws and now I write the laws and I know that nobody is above the law. Um, so she's kind of a, you know, take no crap, um, yeah, former police chief who uh, is, is going to, you know, who I think a lot of reporters had assumed was going mm -hmm, to be part mm -hmm. of this process. She was being dogged by them in the hallways mm -hmm. of Congress, asked if she was going to be one of the House managers because, again, she's really made her a name for herself as being competent in these high stakes hearings from Robert Mueller um, to, you know, again, these dozens of testimonies and depositions that we saw in November and December as it relates to, to the House impeachment investigation. We heard reporters ask Speaker Pelosi uh, about the timing of her delay in choosing not to advance the articles of impeachment over to the Senate after the House voted on them back in December, um, choosing to do it now. You know, why, why not wait even longer to see if more information might come out? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I'm not uh, a political strategist here, um, but I do think the timing is a little precarious for Democrats either way, right? We're getting into the Democratic primary and you have uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's five or six, but a handful of the candidates are actually senators mm -hmm. who are going to be have to sitting be sitting through this impeachment trial six days a week mm -hmm. rather than being out on the campaign trail. Uh, I just don't think Pelosi could have delayed that much longer. I mean, at this um, point, it may make a big difference to Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Amy Klobuchar, because um, we've seen some of the senators, you know, who were on the campaign trail drop out of the race, so they will be here in Washington and not have that conflict, but. The potential for them to be tied to Washington six days a week is very significant. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's you know potentially going to be problematic, especially it's such a malleable and fluid race right now. We saw with the Des Moines Register poll Absolutely. that came out last week with Bernie Sanders, you know, leading in Iowa, but you know only by by the margin of error. Uh, closely followed by Warren, Biden, Pete Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. So anything can happen, and with Biden and Buttigieg potentially having a leg up on them to campaign more and spend all of their time in Iowa and New Hampshire, that, that could hurt these senators. That being said, this is going to be the biggest story in the country. You are going to see Elizabeth Warren, Amy Klobuchar, and Bernie Sanders out there at the stakes giving, holding press conferences after every, you know, every day uh, of these hearings and the prosecution trying to potentially make news and at least, you know, maybe rivaling Donald Trump with being on the front pages of newspapers. But sort of back to the idea of, of Pelosi holding yeah. these, I just am not sure she really could have gotten much more out of the process um, by withholding them and, and not have been accused of sort of dragging her feet there. You know, you had a bunch of Democrats actually last week that were sort of unruly and eventually backtracked on their comments saying it, it's time for her to just give it up here. And noteworthy that, that, that then they did backtrack. I mean, you, you saw Speaker Pelosi sort of snap them in line, and you saw right. them saying, well, uh, well, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> she's it right. Was, it was the equivalent of that moment when she yes, pointed when she at pointed her caucus yes. to stop laughing yeah, and stop clapping. stop clapping when they um, passed when the Articles exactly. of Impeachment. Yeah. Uh, but Adam Schiff makes a really good point mm -hmm. here as well, which is that the information coming in still is damning to the president and really just totally upends a lot of the arguments that Republicans have made. You know, this letter that Rudy Giuliani wrote to President Zelensky explicitly says that I was sent to you with the consent and on behalf of the president to do this job, to talk to you, to, to open an investigation into Hunter Biden. I think the big question here, though, is are Republicans going to view this incoming evidence any differently, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there's already been so many lines drawn directly to the president that Republicans have seemingly willfully ignored. But the question too, Jackie, is will the American public see it as adding to it? And then that's something Republicans have to consider, but also matters in terms of you know, the president's public support and what happens in November. Exactly, uh, and, and that is, again, the, the key thing here, you know, can Democrats move public, move that, that needle of public opinion? Um, and that's, you know, that's something we're going to start seeing to play out on Tuesday. But we did see Speaker Pelosi say that she does believe new evidence has come out and that time is on their side in the sense that we have seen some revelations over the last couple of weeks and she went through like an itemized list of right. just what she thinks has happened of significance 
over this time that she's had this delay. So she's trying to justify it as well. Yeah, and actually I think one of the most interesting things that Pelosi also said was she mentioned mm -hmm. the uh, that the Russians hacked Burisma mm -hmm. and she said, you know, which I think might have seemed random to some people who are listening, but actually when you look at things in, the, in sort of its totality, um, she had said, you know, Americans decide elections, don't let Putin interfere here. Uh, and it's a really, it's a really good point because at the end of the day, this investigation was sparked because a whistleblower complaint uh, showed that the president was acting, uh, you know, off of a conspiracy theory, um, a conspiracy theory that was being propagated by Russian bots and different disinformation campaigns, um, which was that, you know, this is obviously a little bit complicated, but I think it just helps going back to the beginning here, which was that this, this, um, you know, false narrative that Vice President Joe Biden got the prosecutor general of Ukraine fired when he found out that the prosecutor was looking into Hunter Biden's work uh, at this, you know, Ukrainian uh, oil uh, gas company, Burisma. Um, it's not true. Hunter Biden actually wasn't even on the board when that when that prosecutor was fired. Um, but this is was picked up by by the Russian disinformation campaign, made it into the bloodstream of of uh, you know, American news outlets, right wing news outlets, and inevitably ended up on the president's desk. Um, and that's really important to keep in mind here as this has sowed a, a lot of, um, a lot of fractures uh, in, our, in our current country. Well, Jackie Alamany, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, political reporter and uh, anchor of Power Up, the newsletter you can get every morning. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me, Libby. Well, the next step in this impeachment process will be a vote in the House of Representatives that's scheduled for 1230 this afternoon. The vote will be to authorize the managers of the impeachment trial of Donald Trump and authorize the funds for that trial. We'll come back around noon to bring you that vote live and uninterrupted. And this is a good time to remind you to subscribe to The Washington Post, whether you're watching on YouTube and you click the subscribe button or on your homepage at WashingtonPost.com, click that blue button in the upper right hand corner. It supports all the reporting here at The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Thank you so much for watching.